Welcome back to the Commentary Corner, where all we talk about is commentary 24-7. On my right and or left is the number one commentary critique, Panda Global's own Swar. How you doing, buddy? <laughs> so I... I'm good. I'm good. I don't even know where this is going. So h- how's everyone doing? This is the seventh episode of the set count. Who's your favorite commentator? Um... God. Silent Doom, we know. All right, and over here on the other side, the other side of the commentary corner is Unrivaled's very own Sage. I don't talk I, I don't talk about commentary that much. No one does. It, it comes up on the show a lot because people have 80 million questions about commentary. Yeah. And insecurities. So, I'm back. And we're we're gonna put a temporary ban on commentary. We're just gonna there's more to the show than commentary. And what show is this? This show is the set count, your source for tournament results, storylines, and analytics, not commentary, set to the tune of your speakers. This executive order. <laughs> I'm your host, MVG Vasef. And I am back from Japan, and I am definitely not a tyrant, even though I started off the show with an executive order. You literally started, <laughs> like, a commentary ban right out the door. We're done. Green We're cards. Done, dude. I fell asleep. <laughs> I fell asleep listening to the commentary section last week on the plane, and I was like, that was bad. I should listen to it, because I'm part of the show. But it, it's it's a lot. So what's on the docket today, Vaseth? Oh, dude, we're going to do the numbers, which I like that, like, musical thing that we're doing. We're going to end with the run back, which I can't believe Sage actually reverbed your voice. <laughs> like, that was. You said sample it, so, like, I'm going to sample it. I need that to happen now and forever. Like, what? You could just command Sage to just. No, no, no. I just said I need the run back to be, like, just triple platinum every time. <laughs> that was pretty good. Well, um. We, have, we will have our continuing segments now that they have their own uh, Swar Spice added to them. <laughs> but uh, the main thing we're going to talk about, obviously, is I was in Japan for 10 days and a lot of cool stuff happened. And then we had another 2GGC over the weekend. Yay! And Chicago wasn't free for once? Let's go, Ned. What? Black Nairo. And then... <laughs> and then... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then lots of things were talked about Civil War. And Swar has this tournament tier system he wants to introduce to everybody. Oh, yeah. Like, just, you know, a little here and there. Yeah, because that's one of the things that I know for Frostbite coming up next week, coming to Frostbite, that we were always focusing on was like that. So if the rules have changed, that just defeats a lot of my marketing for the past, like, month. I'm all about defeating marketing. Heck yeah. All right. Specifically, Vases marketing. Shut up. I'm not a tyrant. I swear to God, I'm a very nice person. All right, just. All right, now do the numbers. Do it now. It's time for the numbers. <laughs> so, for the numbers, we're going to go ahead and jump right into it, covering tournaments that happened over this past weekend. The. Uh, let's see, we have the 10th of February going into the 12th. So starting off, we have Midwest Mayhem Saga. We have the 2GGC event, punctuating February with 331 entrants with zero actually taking the whole thing. To the surprise of nobody, zero has now taken two, <laughs> two and the only two 2GGC events that have happened up to this point. So, congrats to Zero taking it with Diddy Kong over Tweak, both in winners and grand finals. You guys, I have a quick question. What? Do you think that that's like kind of flawed? That he took it? No, of course Zero's gonna take it. Like Zero's the best player in the game still. That he should have not been able to enter. But there's still only one person qualified for the championship now, and like they publicly came out and said that, like. Should that be the case? It's going to be a zero round robin against zero, like, on two controllers. <laughs> what if zero wins every single 2GG? Does he just, like, auto win the pot and there's no championship at the end? I mean, he should. Like, like, 
Maybe he shouldn't be allowed to compete for the next one, right? Thank you. See, that's what I was going to say. At least that's what they did with Tokaigi. If you qualified, you were done. That was it. Yeah, congrats. Moving on. I feel like inevitably they're going to have to put out an announcement at some point that's like, hey, highest placing from these events that isn't zero gets to qualify. If, if that's something they're going to do, they better do it before Civil War. Before. Because that would mean, like, Tweak would be in, right? Yeah. It would be Tweak and uh, who got second at Genesis Saga? Uh, I think Como. Or Leo? I don't remember. Yeah, but but Zero won that one. Yeah. Well, aren't they going to like bring people in via points or whatever? If you win, you just automatically get in. Through everyone else is just points, right? I have no idea. There was not a whole lot of information put out regarding the actual circuit. Sounds like the PGR. I think it was vague on purpose. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sounds like the PGR. <laughs> All right. I agree. Jokes. I agree. Jokes. Then we had Austin's really feeling at 16, which to me is like, I don't know about that name um, personally, but uh, Austin's really feeling at 16 is the 16th tournament where Austin's really feeling it in Austin, Texas. 163 people. Trella actually coming through <laughs> and coming out of hibernation and obliterating Leo, from what I heard. Twice! Twice! Yeah, he kind of crapped on him. I saw Leo as Sheik, and I'm like, this is not okay. I don't even... I tuned into the set, and he was playing Sheik, and I'm like, uh-oh. This is not... Like, this is not normal. But congrats to Trilla. Wait, are you guys not familiar? Are you not familiar with... Leo's Ryu block? Well, we know. We know Dark Shot. I mean, <laughs> no, no, yeah. Like, Leo's convinced Ryu's like the second best character in the game and like loses to them. I mean, sure, Yukin's the second best character in the game. Okay. But when Ally posted, all right, I got to get a Ryu for Leo, I was just like, now nah, you're thinking. I mean, it's. Everyone true. has this like one character that, like, oh, I don't want to play this character. And they just sort of, like, defeat themselves before they get in. And I believe Ryu is Leo's that. But, I mean, he's definitely going to fix that before the next tournament. So good luck with all the pocket Ryus coming up to try to beat Leo now. He'll just only make him stronger. (laughs) Yeah, totally. Then we had in Duluth, Georgia, Gwinnett Brawl February with 131 people with Fatality taking it over Scat. With his Captain Falcon, the world-class hero. Uh, then we had Super Smash Nest 13 in Portland, Oregon, with Kakajin, the elusive Sheik, taking it over 124 people. Congrats to Kakajin. He was on the first panel global rankings, but his uh, pretty elusive presence left it so that we couldn't really categorize him for the second one. But congrats to him. He's a strong player for sure, a hidden boss. And then in... Natick, Massachusetts, we had Gums 13 won by the illustrious Mars, over 107 people with his Zero Suit Samus, with his brother Pug West coming in second place. So congrats to all the competitors this weekend. We had 856 unique competitors meet the threshold across the entire world. So look at that. We're up again in our numbers. Yeah, it's it's pretty impressive that we have been this high up in numbers every single week of 2017. Pretty much. There, there was a dip a little bit, but we're back. We're back. No, I mean, even if you call it like what, episode six, we had 658. Like that's our low. So pretty cool. That's so really good. Yeah, we haven't gone under. And these are the ones that meet our threshold. So there's probably like 60, 70, 80 person uh, monthlies and stuff that happen here and there that we just just don't register for us so there's definitely tournaments or how about 128 person last chance qualifier for a 16 man invitational tournament so how was tokaigi vaseth that was the best segue of all time oh props to me japan was awesome so we talked about umebra or you guys didn't talk about umebra i guess you might have a little bit which one the one that was last week. Oh, yeah, yeah, We decided that we'll let you just discuss everything Japan, so we decided to leave it for this episode. Well, we know that Nairo, Nairo won the Umabura Tokaigi qualifier. We mentioned that in the numbers last week. Back-to-back victories. So 
<laughs> Drake. The thing that is awesome about Nairo is he's been here four times now. And the first time he got first. The second time he got second. The third time he got third. He showed up this time. He said, if I get fourth, I quit. I'm done. Never coming back. And he sort of like channeled that as motivation to like play out of his mind and won two Japanese tournaments back to back. I don't think there's a Japanese player who's won two Umibura quality events back to back. Naira's kind of nasty. He made it to Kagi done quick 2017. Okay, so they literally were not planning on streaming any losers matches, but Naira's matches were over so quickly that they were able to end up streaming losers. <laughs> wow. I'm dead serious. Like they were like, "Listen, Nairo's matches are going too fast. What should we do? And I was like, stream losers. <laughs> and they were like, oh, okay. I was like, people are restreaming on Twitch and people are periscoping from the crowd. Like, the only way for you to stop that from happening is to up your quality and stream. And they were like, okay, 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 okay. Let's go, Nairo. So, yeah, Nairo's the reason why we had so much streamed because he just destroyed people in 30 seconds. It was kind of embarrassing for everyone else involved. However,. For those who don't know what Tokaigi is, um, Tokaigi is a huge event. Like, this tournament itself is not called Tokaigi. Tokaigi is kind of like an E3 type of kind of event. And they have all kinds of tournaments going on. They have all kinds of special events going on. Cosplay contests, all kinds of things. But the look and feel of the event is totally like what I would expect an E3 would be like. I've never been to one, but... I saw I saw the switch there. I saw a lot of expo exhibition Dude, type stuff. There was so much. All right, so we're standing on the main stage, right? Taikai, uh, or not? I should say it in English. The tournament area, and you look to your left, and there's this huge, like multi-story, Splatoon building, like stage made into a building where they have like Splatoon player. Um, spawn ports, and, like, they have the Splatoon guns, where you can take pictures with Splatoon, uh, like, like, so you're, like, in the game, and... They really want Splatoon to be an eSport. Well, dude, it's the biggest one in Japan by far. It blew every other game out of the water as far as numbers go. Yeah, and if you look at the stuff that Nintendo's developing for Splatoon 2, it is... Spectator mode, land mode. They're really pushing it hard. It is super primed to be an eSport. I'm kind of mad. I'm pumped. I love Splatoon. <sighs> yeah. And that entire thing was super cool. The only downside was there were so many people, I couldn't see what was going on, like, ever. But the point is, right next to our stage was an entire huge Splatoon stage where we got to see Splatoon on the Switch and whatnot being played at, like, the super high level, and we got to see, like, the layouts and stuff and how they could possibly do an eSport, and I'm super excited. Um, then right next to that was a huge arms demonstration, <laughs> which I'm not sure if you guys were aware, but didn't the buzz win beat somebody? The buzz and I were allowed to participate in this event. So, uh, we, we, we got to play the game a little bit and like warm up and the game is really fun. Is it? And while the buzz was playing in the tournament, I was able to talk to, representatives from nintendo and on arms about the game and like running it as a t possible tournament game oh god like wouldn't everybody need their own joy con and stuff like how would that work i mean isn't that just the same as bringing your own controller to a smash event i guess right i know the answer but unfortunately i can't tell you the answer oh my but god <laughs> let me tell you that your new tag is vague seth <laughs> that it is really cool. I'm super excited about just like what I saw at Splatoon and what I saw at Arms. And yeah, DeBuzz ended up having the hardest bracket of all time in that tournament. It was uh, it was a eight person single elimination bracket, and you had to pull randoms uh, from a box. And DeBuzz was randomly paired against Abadango first round. Let's go. And then he got paired against Momochi, the Street Fighter Five god. And he beat him. And he beat him. And uh, then... Definitely noting that for the PGA. There you go. Momochi. Win over Momochi for the buzz. Let's go. <laughs> and then, uh... 
Uh, he ended up losing super badly to a kid. I don't know if he's a kid. <laughs> I just imagine like an eight-year-old throwing hands. There was there was an eight-year-old who got pretty far in the tournament and was very good, but this guy beat him. But there was two people who won basically like the king of the hill day one thing, and they ended up taking the tournament. This one guy in particular, he was probably in high school or college, I would assume, but he was a younger guy, and he just slaughtered everybody he played. It was, like, not close. But he had only played, like, that day. He, like, went up there, played, and then he started playing the, like, King of the Hill tournament or whatever. Like, if you lose, you're out, and then the person, next person comes in and they just record who has the most wins. And, like, there was an eight-year-old kid who got 16 in a row, and the guy who ended up winning got, like, 15 in a row. Let's go. And they ended up just beating every pro because it was, like, them two and then, like, pro gamers or celebrities that were in this tournament. (laughs) Wow. And they ended up just massacring everybody. It was crazy. I think arms would be a hilarious esport. Like, how great would it be to tune in to CEO and see two dudes actually boxing in the ring? Jeez. <laughs> it sounds cringy when you start picturing certain people do it. No, like, but they, they were getting really into it because they knew that they were getting, like, live stream, you know? Oh, my God. So, like, they were, like, really, like, going through it and having, like, a lot of fun. And it really added to it, especially the way the stage was set up. But, uh, again, I'm just saying, like, we're doing this Smash Brothers tournament that is surrounded by huge booths of these up-and-coming games. And there was something like 68,000 people or so. There was a lot of Twitch, or not Twitch, whatever, Nico, Nico, like, uh, the stream was, like, 120,000. Like, wow. And, like, Splatoon had something double that, I believe. What? And then, like, behind arms was Breath of the Wild, where they had, like, leather couches where you could sit down and, like, put on a headset and play, like, the first X amount of minutes of the game. It's, like, 20 minutes or so. Like, you could do, like, a fetch quest and, like, go back. And then they had 1-2 Switch. But the cool thing about 1-2 Switch's booth was they had themed rooms for each minigame. <laughs> so, like, in the dojo one, it was, like, in a dojo. Yeah, but you're still playing, like, 1-2 Switch at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dude, the game's fun. Is it? I'm so unhyped about it. It's it's just... That's like kind of like you're hanging out. You have a group of friends. Maybe you guys went out. Like, you partied a little bit and you come back. And <laughs> you play this game. <coughs> and you just have a great time. <laughs> Why not just WarioWare or something? Well, that's basically it. It's, it's just a minigame compilation. Like, those are always fun. Anyway, like it, it doesn't have to be sustainable. It just has to be fun for the time you play it. So I, so I saw TriCasters for Smash. Can you tell us a little bit about oh, yeah, them? Yeah, like, so who were they? Let, let, let's let's back up and like just like set the stage. Yeah, there was that, and then we go to Smash. Now let's go back to the day before Smash. I know that you guys were talking about huge budgets and blah blah blah. Well, I was living that. We're talking like a staff of twenty people, like on production. And then tons of staff for the entire event that was just shared to, like, sort of, like, help people in all the different events. So, But just behind the stage, there was at least 20 people just, like, doing everything. Wow. And I I had to be there Friday night with the MC, the two commentators, and... um, Well, there was three. The MC... Oh, uh... She was the MC. (laughs) She was the MC. Hype. Um, so I was there with the MC. I was all about her. She would say nothing for an entire match, and then the last stock would get taken, and she would just be like, Oh, wow. <laughs> She'd say stuff like, Wow, Sonic's really cool. And the two commentators with no smash just, like, died inside. <laughs> <laughs> like, like they were, like, inside. I was like, I'm, on a, I'm so dead. I want to kill. Basically... In Japan, um, television is really, really, really powerful. Just it's a huge, powerful industry. Probably more so than here because, like, TV has been diluted by Netflix and Hulu and all these on-demand services and stuff. It just doesn't have the power that it used to. But in Japan, it still very much does. So appearance fees and what you need to do to be, like, considered relevant or decent broadcasting is super high. So they bring in these, like talents or these idols to come here these professional you know showbiz people 
And without them, your show is nothing. So they, they literally bring out this girl to MC. And it's to – because she has something like – she has a ridiculous amount of people following her on Twitter. So then you automatically get all those people. And she gets more fans because she's now in the Smash Brothers world. Now, she does actually play Smash and stuff. But the reason she was there literally is because she's a showbiz professional MC. And they hired her specifically to do that. Wow. Oh, wow. <sighs> okay, so in the rehearsal, <laughs> the, the commentators were like, listen, the pace of this game moves really fast, so all I want you to do is, like, do that. And she did, and I died. I was like, are you kidding me? He's like, literally, just be like, Sugoi! Or like, wow! Or, Ine! Or something like that. And, like, that's all she did. Still better than like ninety seven percent of North American commentators. Let's be honest. Oh my god, dude, it was it was pretty awesome. The only one thing was she was just like when Ken was winning, she was just like, "Wow, that that Sonic can really move. He's such a cool looking character." And everyone's just like, "Yeah." <laughs> but yeah, so I had a meeting with her, and then the two guys. Now the two guys are from uh, the Smash community here, so like they know everything about the game. And um, one of them in particular is very good. And the other was a last minute replacement because QB qualified for the tournament, even though he was supposed to be doing commentary or casting. He qualified for the tournament, so they had to last minute find a replacement for him because he got third at uh, Umebra, I believe. So that guy was like really nervous, but ended up doing pretty well. But anyway, so we have an actual script. You guys were talking about writers. They Ooh. handed all of us a script, and like you open it, it was something like thirty pages long, and there's graphics with stage directions for every single set. Wow! Yeah, you could see it when they I were mean, actually casting. They production. had like the, those little pieces of paper that they were like constantly flipping through because it just had a bunch of information. It was, uh, basically what it was is was a script of what they were supposed to say between matches, bringing up the next matches, and then the only thing that was free, obviously, was the game itself. But like even at arms. There were certain rules, like we couldn't start until the casters were like, they were talking to the players before each match. They were like, "The Buzz, how do you feel about this match?" And he'd be like, "Man, I feel great." And then I'd have to translate it, and they'd be like, "And hey, Abadango, how do you feel about this match?" He's like, "I don't know, man. This ninja character is really strong." He's like, "Wow, that's great. Are you ready? Go!" Or something. And then at that timing, the players had to like click L and R together to play. It was, like, very similar like that for, like, all the games that I've seen at Tokaigi. It's, like, very scripted, very, this is what we're going to do, this is what we're going to say, this is where you're going to go at each interval. And that was honestly really cool. That's the feature. It wouldn't be that hard to implement that kind of thing, but it goes back to what you guys were talking about last week, where if you have these commentators and these other people, like, they're not available the night before to do a meeting. Like, our meeting took two hours, where we actually not only um, did a basic run through behind the stage, but then it was actually being streamed live. So they were streaming the rehearsal live. So you definitely knew the internet was working and people could laugh and be like, Oh, this is what they're going to do tomorrow. Well, ha 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 ha. And like, we had like Umeki play somebody as pretending to be, Oh yeah, it was Umeki pretending to be shoe tone and QB pretending to be the buzz. So that way I could walk through like my interpretation role. So they were trying to speak in Japanese, and I was like, no, QB, you're the buzz. You have to speak in English. And he was like, okay, I ban uh, town and city. And Mickey and everybody just died. But this is being live streamed. So we're 100% rehearsed before the day. We've already streamed something before the day. And we have this whole script and everything, and everyone's like all in one place. I'm so jealous. Yeah, I would love to do something like that. But it's super hard because, like, the current caster culture is just, like, show up 15 minutes before your pool and co or block whatever and commentate. But if you wanted to do something like these rehearsals, you need commentary seminars, essentially, where you're, you're working with your caster team for, like, two days ahead of the event. But that's basically impossible because we can never get into the venue until maybe the night before to set up because we're booking these venues for as little time as possible. Yeah, um, it's also tough because, like, those guys were there for seven hours. Yeah, it's rare that I get a caster that, like, they'll come over and say hi during setup, but no one really goes through anything. They're all just like, yo, what's up? We're going to cast later. 
Do you have my Twitter it's handle? Not, no, no, no. I mean, um, not that. Like the actual event was just those three for seven hours straight. They didn't have any swapping or outs. Like we usually do in two hour blocks, which I actually like. But these guys, like, if they had bathroom breaks, it was rough because they suddenly went from tri casting to dual casting. So th- there was definitely positives and negatives for the event. It's cool to see the difference in culture between a Japanese production and an American production. And, like, in American production, we would be so focused on, like, headsets and live graphics and stuff. And theirs was very minimalistic, I guess. Well, I mean, like, like I said, there was 20 people backstage. They had fully licensed animated, um, like, slides for each match with the actual text from Smash Brothers. I mean, you can get the font from Smash Brothers. Like, it's an open font that you can find. Oh, but it was a, it was a Nintendo-sponsored event. So, like, they got assets and everything from Nintendo directly. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Which evidently isn't that hard to do. I'm going to work on that. But um, it was just a completely different experience. I know that, like, myself included and the other six of us who were there were kind of like, whoa, this is this is kind of like the future. It's like, why are we doing this? And they, they bought us lunch. But the lunch was cold, right? And they had, like, these, like, pouches that if you put water on and close the, the box, like, your box lunch over it, it would, like, warm it up in three minutes. It would, like, instantly start steaming it, and, like, you'd have hot food. It was like, what? what? Even the Japanese players, I was like, oh, they were like, oh, this must be something that's normal in Japan. The Japanese players were like, yo, Alex, how'd you get this to work? And I was like, <laughs> just read the, destruct- the instructions, please. It'd be awesome to do something like that. But no event really has a 20-man crew for production ever. We're bringing 9 to Frostbite, and that's considered large for a uh, Smash Brothers event. Yeah, I don't think... I think one of the main reasons is just because they had all the people doing like the live animations and like the VTRs and uh, the roll-ins. And like the MC not only was just her by herself, but her like producer or manager or whatever was back there. Like just in case she needed anything. Um, there was people from various companies, just production side and corporate side, like a lot of things, just like monitoring the chat, like people live monitoring the chat. Live chat moderation is kind of crazy. We just use a mixture of like an automated bot and online people. Well, at, with Nico Nico, they scroll across the screen, so. Huh, true. I thought that I really wish we could adopt Nico Nico because I love the streaming platform, and I think that scrolling over horizontally is just, it's just really funny. <laughs> I don't know. Like, maybe it just worked because it were, they were all characters I couldn't understand and it looked hype. Even though, they, even though they would type Nairo with, like, 17 O's as he got, like, a 10-second kill. But it was, it was remarkable only because of the fact that on top of the actual, like, content you were viewing, like, keeping in mind that over 100,000 people were watching is just, like, Wow. Like, we don't ever get that. <laughs> like, I think 2GGC Midwest Mayhem Saga had, like, 20-something. So, that's ridiculous. I wish I was there. I wish we were there, but... Each player had their own podium and their own monitor and everything, too. Was... Podium was cool, but it's just, like, essentially another table. Yeah, I mean, I, I think setups where they're looking at each other... Per, like, I think the 2GGC setup... Is very cool where they have like them shaking over the monitors and whatnot, but I think the podium idea is also cool. I mean, it's just different styles of staging. The main reason was because they had multiple cameras. Oh, yeah, the camera angles, like it was so good. It was just so good. And placing them that way lets you get really good angles on like reaction pop offs and stuff. And then each camera was obviously manned by a person. You know what I mean? Like, we're talking about actual TV quality. It was. Do they have... So that was the third Tokaigi, right? Um. So Nico Nico does Tokaigis and Chokaigis, and the events are slightly different. Tokaigis more of like something you could go to to see like the Switch or whatever. Um, Chokaigi has like a lot of different other events. Like there's a lot of kids events and stuff like that. But um, this is the third one that of those brands that has involved Smash. Because I believe Miyuki and Zero went to Chokaigi first. Then they went to Tokaigi last year and this year. And Vesa, or not, not Vesa, Jesus, Sakurai really wasn't there? No, but Nintendo very much was. 
So, as much as you can tell us normies, how was that? Like, how were they? Were they involved? Were they kind of off hands? Were they, uh, or sorry, hands off? Or were they kind of in your ear? I mean, did you get to catch lunch with them? Did you talk about the PGR, etc.? <laughs> did you talk about the PGR? Uh... I, I got a plug. I got a plug, man. Um, so I will answer those questions in no particular order with no, 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 yes, absolutely yes, that was awesome, no, and yes. That may have been the least helpful response I've ever heard on this show. <laughs> so they did talk about the PGR, that's cool. Hell yeah. If all right, anyone, all right, I, I, if all right, any, right. wait, 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 listen, hold on. Swar, if, if, Swar, listen, wait. No, you listen to me. A moment. Tyrant. Vesa oh. wants to let you know that when I had multiple meetings in Japan and I absolutely brought up the PGR and what you guys were doing and they said that that is probably the most important thing and what separates it from different games because there are people who get joy out of games simply because of the statistics and the fact that you guys have that already puts you ahead of the game. I did see it. Okay, so, so you're I, welcome. So I can die happy. I can die happy that Nintendo even knows what the hell PGR means. It exists. Swar's peeing himself in excitement. I'm like pissing everywhere. In a meeting I had. That literally happened. It happened in... Actually, it was brought up again in a secondary meeting on the last day of Tokagi. Now that I remember that. Madam on multiple agendas. But... Yeah, dude. I went there... Because we have to talk about our scenes and like what everything... Like arms... As cool as Tokagi was, the arms setup was even cooler. Can we not talk about arms? No, can we talk about arms? No, 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 no. Like, seriously, just, like, the way... From a tournament organizer's perspective and how things were run and, like, how it worked and whatnot, the the arms thing was even cooler than the Topagi thing. It had even less people competing, but even more staff. It was... And, like, all the players were mic'd up on stage. <laughs> oh, we're doing that at Frostbite. Really? Oh, are we? Hell yeah. Yeah, we'll have players mic'd up to listen to, like, bands and stuff. Well, how are you gonna handle when someone's like, fuck? Honestly, <laughs> you just kind of roll with it. Uh, it makes for really good TV. People like it. It's funny. But, yeah, it's it might happen. You never know. There's not a whole lot you can do about it. That's not esports. We don't have the resources to be able to take someone and dedicate them to just listening to the stream and bleeping on a delay. Is that where you're going to tell the sheriff when he knocks on your door with the Twitch citation? What? <laughs> I don't know what sheriff has a Twitch citation. <laughs> if that happens a bunch of times, worst case scenario, our channel gets flagged for mature audiences only, which half the esports streams already are flagged for that, so it's not a big deal. If you curse, that's a stock. Yeah, add it to the rules. Curse, it's a stock. Wow. Hey, PG-13 is allowed, like, what, two F-bombs a movie or something like that? That changes all the time. I mean, you can see Walking Dead when you're just flipping from QVC to ABC, so, I mean, we're living in an amoral society anyways. Wow. But, anyway, I think what was interesting is I noticed that besides, like, the trained professionals, like, the celebrities that were playing in the tournament, they were actually quieter than they normally were. Huh. Like, maybe because they were concentrating on a new game and whatnot, and, like, talking while playing is already hard, especially a game that you're not familiar with. But I had to keep it running to Buzz. I was like, to Buzz, you're mic'd up, you can say so. I hope people take advantage of the fact that they're mic'd at Frostbite. It just creates, like, goofy television. People eat it up all the time. Yeah, so th that's something that I thought was kind of cool. I also liked how the commentators were able to interact with the players in both tournaments, honestly. And... Just this whole Japanese culture of, like, interviewing players. Like, that's what the MC's job was. Is she was going to go up and she was going to be like, yo, let me, let's start off this top 16 by bringing everybody up to the front. I'm going to go up there and I'm going to ask. And it, it started something because, like, the youngest kid, Kare, like, he was like, I'm going to beat all the foreigners. And all the foreigners <laughs> were at the end of the line and they were like, oh, no, he didn't. And... Ally was like, I'm sorry, or uh, Kamehameha was like, I'm sorry to everyone here, and I know you worked really hard to get here, but I'm going to win. And then, like, it gets to Ally, and Ally was just like, I want everyone to have fun, except for Kamehameha. I will, be I will beat you, or something like that. And, like, 
everyone just started like trash talking each other and it was funny because the people who trash talked the most got o2'd the fastest the loudest one in the room is the weakest as they say so that was that was pretty interesting it was pretty fun did uh did all the western big names and stuff and like mr r get a lot of attention or how was that yeah well i mean esam is one of the more popular players which is why i wanted to get him over there in the first place he plays a very popular character with you know, somebody who doesn't, a uh, character that isn't very popular outside of ECM. Like, to us, it's probably normal, and, like, we probably have a lot of Pikachus, but really, outside of that, there isn't any. So, there was legitimately tons of ESAM fans being like, picture, 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 friendly, 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 how do you do this, how do you do that, picture, picture, picture. And it was just great. It was awesome. Like, they were many celebrities for a weekend. Oh, uh, they must have had so much fun. It was an outstanding trip jelly well uh for us back at home during the same time we were watching 2ggc midwest mayhem how'd you feel about uh seeing your brethren fall sage uh it was interesting uh unfortunately in doubles there was a whole bunch of midwest team kills there i think one team played three other midwest teams in a row (laughs) damn it sucks that there was it happened because of upsets but also there were like a lot of midwest players for doubles in like one pool. Singles was interesting. Our boy, hometown hero, Ned coming through. Seeing him get fourth was really awesome. He took a lot of really good names. Uh, Three out Void, 3-1, Larry. I think 3-0 or 3-1 against Captain Zack. I don't remember what that one was. Unfortunately, he did it uh, right after he's no longer playing for Unrivaled. Wait, you dropped him? Released. They released him. Released is a better word. What? Euthanized. Basically, we're pushing forward as a production company. Uh, Ned is looking more for like a team to play on versus just kind of like having someone support him. So we both agreed it would be better for us to kind of part ways, but we're still going to support him as best we can as he looks for like a larger team. Oh, nice. Yeah. I think that's just the smartest way to go about it. It's like literally no hard feelings. Like, you know, Ned getting ditched for makeup girl. Oh my God. Uh, Awful. Did you, did you, did you get a chance to see the production side of things this time? For Midos Mayhem Saga? Yeah. Yeah, I got to catch some of it. Unfortunately, I was uh, I was busy traveling this weekend, so I didn't get to see all of it. But I got to see some of Top 8, and I saw some of the early stuff. It was all right. Uh, it wasn't, I wasn't, like, blown away. Tokagi definitely blew it out of the water. That was the production of the weekend, for sure. Yeah, there's just not the money. The money is not even close. 2GG is definitely upping their game. But I the, the money's not there, and I think they they have a lot to learn still. I think that they're experimenting with a lot, which deserves um, a lot of praise because you know they're they're sort of setting a lot of precedents and how we could do things. I think that the biggest thing missing still is just like context, stats or not. Like there's just not a lot on the overlay that people can absorb about the match um, at the current moment. Content-wise, is definitely bare bones still. Yeah. Content that isn't related to the actual match that's going on, or is but not directly the match, is probably the hardest thing to bring into a stream. You need a really good team who's really capable of, like, kind of w- working with timings, and you need to be able to trust each other on what you can do across the board. So if your team is really split up and your jobs aren't, like, interlocked at all, it can be really rough. But I liked what they did with replays, where instead of filling the app with just casters like rambling, they were just showing replays. Yeah, they definitely got a lot of stuff going on over there, and uh, we 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 got to see the young Lord Sturm out there. That was cool. Yeah, yeah that was nice for him. He got a he got a nice little break getting to commentate on Two GG for quite a few people. So you got a lot of commentators actually putting in a lot more work now, and I think you're gonna start seeing more names coming out. Oh uh, no, no banned, banned. Yeah. <laughs> Auto ban. Man, no more, no more commentator talk. We're just giving props. Just shouting out the guys that are working hard. Okay. All right. All right. All right. <laughs> all, right all right. No more commentary talk. <laughs> I forgot where I was going with that. I had a point to bring up and I forgot. You said uh, Dyer and Sturm and you were. Oh, 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 oh. I, I remember. I remember. Uh, we need to train our MCs. Oh no, <laughs> my boy Z Fly. You have to practice being an MC. And 
you don't always have to try to do crowd interaction. Sometimes you're just emceeing for the stream. I think that there was just... I, I saw TK actually post a video on, like, the current MC situation in Smash, and he mentioned that, like, Smash crowds actually suck, which... It's kind of like oh, they totally do. It's kind of true, kind of half true. It also moves responsibility away from the MC. But poor Z Fly was dealing with like the worst hand. I mean, a top four with three clouds and zero at the helm. Like, yee, yee. That's just that's just not fun. I like Z Fly a lot too. He gave it his all and just got nothing in return. I think he called everybody in the Midwest crew battle like. Dark shot or something that was like a meme going around. No, that that was on the video. What do you mean? It was the thumbnail. I know because because of the fact that he introduced everybody as dark shot. Oh, okay. Fair he enough. just like I think lost track or something, I, or so I've heard. He like, you know, like Ned would come up and then he would sit down and then somebody else would beat Ned and then he would ask the person who would beat Ned. So how was beating dark shot? And it's like, dude, that's Ned. <laughs> Poor guy, honestly. I mean, if he had a script that was rehearsed the day before for two to four hours. And we had money. And, I mean, to be honest, like, there's a lot of those comments, because I, I watched some of it, because the main bulk of the tournament, I was playing ARMS. But um, I, I was able to wake up early and watch uh, at least most of the crew battle. And... The players didn't really help him much either. Their their answers were possibly some of the worst I've ever heard. Punishable by death, man. Like Ned's was really bad. We're gonna do it. Or something like, what was the worst one? And he's like, I'm gonna make a meal or something. Sometimes I feel like Smash deserves. Somebody said I'm gonna make them kneel or something. I think that was Larry. No, that was like for sure Dark Shad. Yeah. There's this Midwest meme, I guess, where uh, there's a Ryu player named Renegade from Indiana, and he just talks about the dragon, Ryu, all the time, like constantly. And he's just like, everyone's going to kneel to the dragon. <laughs> and now everyone just says it, I guess, about Ryu. Most people don't get it. I don't get it. But all the Ryus use it in the Midwest. There's like all four Hype. of them. I didn't see it, but it sounds super cringy. Yeah, it didn't come off very well so either way we need writers we need scripts we need rehearsals let's do it we can do it guys everybody but besides that there were a lot of announcements about civil war evidently talking about and the money. teams were finally finally uh released now i can finally talk about them yay we did it those teams do not look fair at all they're not you want to name them yeah sure i got it so on Team Ally, you have DeBuzz, Abadongo, Mr. R, Mars, Kameme, Zenodo, Mr. E, Ned, and Pink Fresh. Sounds good. But on Team Zero, you have MKLeo, Nairo, Renai, Larry Lur, Void, Komorikiri, Anti, Chela, and Fao. <laughs> I love that Fo's back. Yeah, he's just like randomly on there. I'm here for it. But yeah. Those do not look even at all. Well, to be fair, Zero was really, 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 really into it. And he really went out of his way to recruit people. Ally does not care. Larry Lur's profile picture right now is him hugging Ally, and he's on Team Zero. <laughs> yeah, how the hell did that happen? I thought Leo and Ally were, like, super tight or something. The rest of this, though, seems to mostly make sense. Talking about talking about money though, thirty thousand dollars in the pot, a block party, and three days of twenty four hour venueing. What? Yeah, I thought that was announced already, like beforehand, except for the block party. The full overnight venue was not announced. Fifty vouchers for PGR players for flights. Okay, that that was like completely out of left field. <laughs> like. Assuming that a couple of them are local, some of them are going to decline, even on a good day, 35 people go and they can nab them at 300 each. That's still over $10,000. The biggest... In addition to the $10,000 for the crew battle and the $30,000 for that 
Not including in addition to everything else. The biggest, the two biggest pot, like pot sizes in the past year were UGC and Evo, both only over like seventeen thousand. So, L O no Evo had over twenty k. Not for Smash Four singles. Yes, it did because they had over two thousand people. Two thousand times ten is twenty k. You're right. Bam. Bam, bam, stats, man. Let's go. I'm, I'm talking about UGC, then. Yeah, UGC only had a 15k pop bonus, though, so this is 30k only to Smash 4. Yeah, they split the 40k across, like, 5k for each game's doubles, and then 15k for each game's singles. And it was a pretty small turnout overall for the actual size of the pot, but next year's UGC should be actually insane. I can't wait. But yeah, that's, uh, that's quite a lot of bit of coin. A lot, of, a lot of Mario and Sonic coins in there. I mean, they have been talking about they want this to be the greatest event of all time. And, like, while the crew battles are starting to get... Eh. I think it'll still be hype. I mean, maybe, but I think if you're a TO and you're listening to this, please stay away from crew battles for a while. I think we should all just, like, make this agreement to not do crew battles until they're relevant again. Do coin battles. This crew battle seems like the perfect cap to crew battles. Like, all right, let's just stop for a while now. I mean, it could be great, but it also could be USA versus the world again. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's true. Like, there's a way for Ally to win this. And if he does, like, that's even cooler because, like, well, they win $1,000 each. That alone is insane. But there's a way. Crew battles are so determined on who wins the first match. Not always. Almost effectively, because then you always have the counter pick advantage from that point on. So whoever you put out first can largely determine the effect of the crew. But that's like what's fun about crew battles is that sometimes you get the guy that just comes in and takes five stocks. Right. What I'm no, what, what I'm basically saying is Ally can win if he picks the right person to go out first and they take that early advantage. If they knock out the uh, Team Zero person first before they get knocked out first, I think they can win. Even with the disparity of strength. Yeah, everyone on Ally's team has someone that they just do really well against. So if they go out first and happen to get an advantageous matchup, the crew battle could be interesting. Are you guys surprised that we don't have, like, other killers? Like, where's Tweak? I mean, Ned's good and all, but, like, wouldn't you, if you wanted a Cloud, wouldn't you just go for Tweak? What do you mean? Tweak might have declined. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Plus, Ally seems like he's building his team solely on, like who he really likes. Like, Ned is Midwest, along with Ally, and they play all the time. So, Ally either A, knows something and believes in Ned, or he might just be like, hey, support Midwest. Let's get Midwest out there. It's Team Ally and friends. <laughs> Friendship. Where Zero went the exact opposite. He was just like, oh yeah, Ally, you want to do it? Well, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to get everybody. Yeah. So I think I think that pretty much covers Civil War. It's gonna be a hype event. It's like in a month and a half. Frostbite's coming up next week. It's gonna be fun. There's also the uh, yeah. the the setup count, hundred plus setups. Uh, I think they said something like they're gonna have thirty two or something for friendlies the whole time. Four forty. And the panel that they're uh, they're putting together, where it's like content creators and influential people. That's cool. Like the only other event we've seen that does panels like that is Super Smash Con. Right. So. There's a there's a lot of interesting stuff going on. Oh yeah. There's yeah. I don't know if everything's been announced or because like when the venue used to be at Vegas, there used to be more. And now that it's back in LA, there is technically more that but they they weren't able to do some things, but now they're able to do more things. So I unfortunately haven't been in the loop for like a month or so. So it's kind of cool how the event is going on, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I think that covers Civil War. I can touch on the tournament tier system, which would have already been out for a couple days now. Beefy Smash dudes will have covered it by Tuesday, so that's hype. They're really awesome. Their news series on YouTube, the Smash News, <laughs> uh, does a really good job of covering news week to week, or I think it's every two weeks. And it's in C5's voice, and we actually have a surprise for next week. Uh, can we say that now? Yeah, I don't see why not. Yeah, so C5 from the Beefy Smash Dudes will be on next week, which will be great because, I mean, if you've ever wanted to know about 
beefy smash dudes then you're gonna find out right from the founder and we're gonna talk about like content uh content creation the current environment for content in smash youtube twitter i mean some people don't ever make a youtube account and they have great smash content like anti on twitter and other people only do twitter like alpharad and uh mighty keef and beefy smash dudes for example so We'll be talking about that, but really quick, the tournament tier system for everyone who has seen it by now is essentially PG Stats' answer to how uh, tournaments can be categorized uh, from tiers S, A, B, and C, with S being the best, C being the weakest. Um, currently in the tournament tier system index, the only S tier tournament is Genesis 4 uh clearly so so tier ones are now instead of being tier one they're s tier yeah but the only reason we did sabc is because because we actually actually added an extra tier tier four just sounded silly to say oh tier four event so yeah no, i agree with that it's just it was just whatever plus a b s a b c is stuff that just is essential to tier lists it can under it could also be spread to other fgc titles hint hint but uh yeah the only <laughs> as a music game player i like this rank awesome so the only s tier event is genesis which should be pretty obvious but the only a tier events are actually the two two ggc events and the only upcoming A tier event is actually Frostbite. So congrats Let's to Frostbite. Go! You guys are about 400 points away from being an S tier event. So you'd either need a serious pot injection of money or get like five or 10 more PGR people to come. But basically, the tournament tier system is divided by four categories entrance, PGR players, top 20 PGR players, and prize money. Each category has its own weight. And a lot of that methodology is described in the article that we have posted on Twitter. It's our pinned tweet right now. And we didn't want to reward money so hard because not only is money fickle in our current tournament ecosystem, but Japan doesn't use money. So we have a system that heavily favors top player density. And that's something that luckily Japan has. So for example, Tokaigi 2017, only with 16 people, still qualified as a B tier event. So that's pretty incredible considering it only had 16 people. but um, That is really cool, actually. Thank you for that. You know, yeah, we had to make something that didn't bend over backwards for Japan, but also kept out scrubby tournaments from the West that, you know, happens to have like 100 or so people or whatever. So it's a pretty cool inclusive system. It's obviously going to be uh, a little wacky because our scene is wacky. And there's only 50 PGR players, and six of them are in Japan. Uh, the rest are split between West Coast and East Coast, and others just can't travel as readily. So hopefully this just gives people things to aim for as they plan their tournaments and as sponsors can support tournaments. Because, like I said, uh, this can just pretty much show you what you need if you want to make your event S tier, A tier, B tier, C tier. S is pretty much just reserved for the classic uh, events we all we all know and love like Genesis, CEO, and Evo. So nothing will be changing, but I will probably we'll probably be seeing more A tier events only because of the oversaturation. Like every weekend, these top players could have been at one tournament, but instead they have to choose between a bunch of other mid level tournaments. So that'll be interesting going forward. Mm hmm. No, I really like this layout. Like, no, I'm seeing it for the first time. I know you linked it to me while I was in Japan, but I didn't get to see it. But I do like this. It reminds me of Skittles. It just looks very, very clean. Yeah, you sent it to me as well, and I opened it, saw a spreadsheet, and it was like, nah. So I was just like, show this, show this to Xylus, he'll appreciate it. Yeah, well, there is actually help given by Practical Tasks, if you guys ever heard of him. He does a lot of stuff in Melee. Uh, he does a lot of like actual like like technical assisted stuff, like combo videos and things. Uh, and analysis on frame data and melee and he helped me a lot with the methodology and weighting of this system because he said that in his testing raw entrance and money was just giving a huge amount of inconsistencies because you'll have something like civil war have thirty thousand dollars and evo will only have like 20 but evo is harder than civil war you know what i mean like uh in theory if there's two thousand people going again but yeah i mean there's a lot of stuff 
uh, that we're implementing for the scene that we want to have transparent so people can follow this as the PGR gets made so that they don't have any uh, surprises and stuff. So that's pretty much it. And I think unless you guys want to say something, we can just go into the run back. Yeah, it's pretty self-explanatory. Check it out. Go to the PG Stats Twitter. It'll be there. I You said it was the pin tweet, so... Use it to market your events, TOs. Yeah, it's a pretty cool tool. But uh, yeah, the, the run back. Run back. Um, Sage, you want to go first with our weekly listener mail? Yeah, sure. Let me go ahead and uh, pull that up real quick. All right, I'll do the esports thing one. All right, this question is from John Holiday on Twitter at Jolliday89. John Holiday writes Who in Japan made connections with PG in establishing the flow of Japan players that we have in the USA now? I heard mention of wanting to fly more USA players to Japan for big tournaments and wondered who was making that connection. Would that be QB, who I've heard mentioned as a TO for many Japan tournaments? Too long didn't read. Who is making all these behind-the-scenes Japan-USA connections? Oh, and he writes, following, I forgot to include information. Name is John Holiday, tag Jolliday. He's from Toyama, Japan. And his little fun fact is, instead of actually learning Japanese like Faceth, I just married a Japanese girl. <laughs> the, the secret tech. Who can answer this question, I wonder? I really don't know. I don't think we have anyone uh, qualified to answer this question. Is there anybody in the center of the Venn diagram of the United States of America and Japan? It's me! I did it! Why is PG in here? <laughs> no, no, PG, and to my knowledge, PG and Japan are not connected at all right now. PG? It says... Yeah, he asked about PG. Yeah, how, oh. who in Japan made connections with PG <laughs> Me. in establishing the flow of Japan players? Okay, Me. no. Me. This is what happened. Me. Abadango came out to Big House 5, and everyone lost their minds, and I was like, wow, wouldn't it be cool if we had more of this? And no one did it. And I was still like a local TO at this time. And no one did it. And I still waited, and no one did it. And I was like, oh, I guess I gotta do it. So I moved to Japan to like set all this up. The martyr. Oh boy. It did. It happened. And then as far as bringing players over to Japan, this time the only way we were able to do that was because uh, uh, Dewango, who owns Nico Nico, was able to help us get over there. Um, Umebura has been known to help players get over. Uh, pretty much every other organization does not. So if you're looking at organizations that bring over players kind of like we do, uh, it's only Umebura in Tokyo, and that's it. And uh, who runs Umebura? Umeki runs Umebura. Umeki or Peach? Yeah, it's, that's that's where the name comes from. It's Ume, it's Umeki's brothers or whatever. Like, Umebura. It's Umeki Brazas. <laughs> Okay, Slay. Awesome. <laughs> I knew Umeki was a TO. I did not know that he ran Umabura. Me neither. What the, like, how do people, like... Umeki and the... I are the brokest team. Like, he just tweeted this out, actually. He was just like, many people think that Zero Nairo is the best team in Smash 4 right now, but in actuality, it's Umeki Vesa. And I was like, that is correct. I would bet, like, $12 million against you. Yeah, we're, we're, we're not going to be a play them in the game, but like, the best team for Smash 4 right now. Is the what was was the joke that he made because we 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 did some pretty cool things while we were there. Point nine. Point nine. Dude, my favorite comment was everybody scrolling point nine B the whole time. Awful, awful, awful. Like while he was on while he was on there, because <laughs> like everyone was one of the main storylines for Tokaigi was, uh, like we need a nerf bayonet. There's so many bayonets. Thank God we'll get it nerfed, and all the bayonets got bopped. I see through the Bayonetta players. I know what you were doing. You all sandbagged. Listen, I do what I want. Just because they had scripts does not mean that they were reading the script, okay? Anyway, uh, TLDR, who is making all these behind-the-scenes Japan-USA connections? Me. This is me. It's 100% me. That's it. It's There's nobody really else. Obviously, I'm kind of like the middleman between organizations, because it's not like I have all this money. So... I'm the one who invites players when Japan wants to bring people out, and I'm the one who talks to uh, not just U.S., but, like, I work with multiple other countries to get Japanese players to those countries as well. 
and uh, I find those organizations, and I say, hey, this player wants to go. Do you want to bring them out to their tournament or whatever? I'm basically like the Japanese player agent, or the agent for players going to and from Japan. So it's 100% me. I did it. All right. Well, thank you, John Holiday, for your question. He hit us up on Twitter, at the set count. You guys can always tweet at us your questions or uh, send us a DM. Our DMs are always open. Slide in. And then I got one more question from actually Trent Murray, who I think might have asked beforehand. I think I think he did, given that he's saying hello again. So really quick, the title is regarding esportsing of Smash, and it's kind of got a little bit of a blurb. So let's go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> after listening to last week's excellent discussion about the challenges facing Smash, or Smash faces without the resources of other major esports, I wanted to write in and share some thoughts. I came from a League of Legends background, and I watched the game grow since its launch, even working for Riot for a year covering the LCS as a journalist. While Smash will always be hamstrung by the lack of monetary support from Nintendo, it should actually not impede our growth. To me, the biggest thing holding back Smash is the community itself. Think back to the controversy from Shine around the VIP rooms. The whole FGC community was up in arms because the top players got access to a restricted area to rest and practice in. Fans in the league community are overjoyed just to get to stand in line and get one picture with their favorite team. We get to sit down and actually play with the best players in the world. It's like getting to play basketball with LeBron James because you only paid a $10 venue fee. To me, increasing our game's star power is critical to bringing in more money, more sponsors, and more views. I love watching Smash more than any other game, but it will ne- But I will never watch Xanadu unless a top 16 PGR player is visiting. I'm not interested in any monthly until top 8, and only then if I could care less about watching pools unless a top player is on screen. I am positive there are more viewers like me, and there are hardcore fans that just want to watch Smash being played. You want more stream views? Have one stream just follow Mr. R all the way through the early rounds, and another only showing Nairo's games. This is exactly how we open tournaments in MOBAs, and it has worked for years. I could I could go on forever, but I know this concept is extremely counter to the grassroots nature of FGC in general, so I'm curious to see your opinion and that of your listeners before going any further. Thanks, Trent, at Trent underscore esports. That's really cool. I think that following somebody like Mr. Arthur a tournament would be like, that'd be kind of interesting. Because so many of the Smash players that I know that are top players are like, aside from Captain Zack, like, they don't really enjoy the limelight too much. And anti. Yeah, that is very true. Like, they don't. Especially he's Mr. R. I think he's the most anti it out of everybody. He's like, stop forcing storylines and stuff. And that's the example he brought up, which I thought was funny. Yeah, I mean, star power in Smash. Jeez, how do you fix that? It's tough, man. The personalities aren't there. The, the storylines aren't there. We don't have people, like, interviewing and following these guys all over the place. But I think personality is the biggest thing. And when you look at other sports, you have managers for players on, like, how to brand themselves and how to how to represent themselves, what to say, what not to say in an interview, how to, like, create controversy but have it be okay so that more people are looking at them. There's all this stuff that these players aren't taught and aren't trained to do that we as a community kind of just want them to do. And it's just impossible. Like, you, um, unless you're anti. Yeah, I think I've seen Mr. R tweet that, like, this is also very new to them, and they don't understand exactly, like, what exactly needs to be done and a lot of people also just like don't want to be the target of stuff on Twitter, like the garbage that they get if they say something like Pikachu's number one or <laughs> just in general, any opinion, you know? You have to embrace that, though. I know, I know, but, but it's annoying if you think about it. Like, would you want that? Yes. Yes. <laughs> you should rather have a thousand people talking about you where... 500 love you and 500 hate you than just like 500 people talking about you and being like, we love this guy. He's great. The more publicity, the better it is for your brand, no matter what it is. Cause regardless, if you say something that like angers a bunch of people, somebody's going to like retweet it and be like, look at this idiot. But then that guy's friends and followers are going to see it and might go, Oh, I like how like ridiculous he is. I'm going to follow him. And now you've built yourself a new fan and that's, that's huge. We have we don't have people that are like specifically following players because they're a huge fan of them. Like you have a couple here and there. Nairo has the Naifus. Zero has his people, the Scarf Army, I guess. 
uh outside of that though like do you you don't really have huge huge fans for these players yeah i mean not, there's not a lot there to like really soak up or like really follow or die hard for except anti and like mango yeah mango has a whole nation <laughs> mango's the only reason melee exists he's definitely the exception wow like if you look back to it like think about melee without mango Mitsu Kang. You can't. The game doesn't exist. Mitsu Kang. The game doesn't exist. Aw, Jason. Don't do Jason like that. Dude, the game would not exist because Mango brought life into it and continues to bring life into it. And we need that right now. And I think Zero's doing a much better job now when he's talking about doing all these meet and greets and he's uh, talking about like what you need to do for like a, a sponsor and stuff. But like there definitely needs to be more getting out into the limelight and creating these, these narratives. But we, we, we might want to say, let's put him on the mic and like, let's talk, let him talk stuff, uh, trash and whatnot. But we saw what happened in the Nest Mayhem saga. When you give people mics and say, you you want to say for the, for your opponents? Like, yeah, I'm going to win. Okay. Yeah, we did it. I mean, at Smash City LA, like Larry Lurk took the mic and he's like, I'm going to hit him and I'm going to hit him so he doesn't hit me. <laughs> and it's like that sort of stuff is funny between all of us, but it's also like cringy when you don't know who they are and you're tuning in. Oh, yeah, I forgot about that. They had a girl MC there, too, right? Oh, my God. She's like, what's your strategy for the upcoming? Hey, man, give her some credit. She she tried her best. She did, but... We have no writers, so everyone is just guessing. <laughs> you want writers? Go go to, a, go to a publishing house. Well, I think, Trent, Trent you, you raised some great points. I think that we're in a very infantile, cringy state for the esports stardom package. Um, but, I mean, it's also a weird time. Like... There's a, there's a lot of divisive stuff on Twitter. There's a lot of stuff people don't want to do. They don't want to say. But, I mean, you got trailblazers like Anti, who calls out Zenodo on Twitter. And oh just my God, ends yes. his career. Yes. Real quick, uh, what do you think about his idea where he says having a stream to just follow top players, basically? Oof. I mean, I think that'd be really hype. But, like, I think people will, one, I don't know if the player would appreciate it, depending. And also, two, like, I think streamers, stream monsters want to tune in and see all all the nine yards of, like, round one pools and stuff. I don't know. Maybe not. I don't know. Would you do that at your event? Well, what are we talking about right now? Are we talking about monthlies or weeklies? In which case, yes, that makes the most sense. And we should definitely be doing that because we should be putting up our top players. Because the best thing that can happen at a weekly or monthly is... Your top player destroys somebody and it's combo video food, or they get destroyed, in which case it's an upset, and that's what you want on stream. I'm actually on the opposite spectrum, where I think the locals are for your local scene. Like, most of the time, your people viewing are guys from your region, whereas in majors, people are tuning in to see the top talent. I also think part of the star power uh, issue is that we're not marketing it well. A lot of, for players that do want to tune in just for top talent, I mean, you, you don't really have a good way to figure out where that talent, when that talent is going to be on screen. So I think something that we should start doing is like when we have our top seeds at a tournament, it's like put that in your schedule. Be like Wave B Pools featuring XXX. Because all the time I get people come and chat be like, hey, did Void play? And it's like his pool just ended six hours ago and they missed their chance to watch their favorite player. No, I definitely agree about that. Like there, there's definitely a marketing. There, there's there's a lot of things that we could do from the bottom all the way to the top to fix Smash. So marketing it better is one of the things that streamers and EOs need to work together on. Would you try that at Frostbite? Yeah, let's label our schedule as like the pools featuring the top seeds that are there, so people know when they want to tune in to see who they want to see. Wow. Okay, well, you know who to uh, you know who to work with. <laughs> Literally, all three of us are gonna be at Frostbite Broken. Yay, we did it! I I'm I'm so burnt out right now though. Like to be one hundred percent honest, like take a break. I worked so hard for Frostbite for.
from October all the way up until when I left for Tokaiki. And now I'm just like, can't wait to just be there and like be kind of just like a translator. Just give it to, just give the trophy to Zero. Come on. Um, that won't happen. <clears throat> Ooh. All right. That will not happen. So I think that wraps up. I think that wraps up the run back. Sage, yes. Vesa, take us out. Real quick, thank you to Trent Murray for the question. We appreciate it. He hit us up at the set count at gmail.com. You guys can send us any of your questions to our email as well. Yep. Vaseth, take it away. This has been Commentary Corner, where we talk about nothing but commentary 24 7. Do you like the new outro? Let's just do that. From- no. Absolutely not. <laughs> Anyways, guys, thank you so much for listening. This is the set count with Sage, Swar, and Vaseth. Uh, we talked about. What did we talk about? Tokaigi, so 2GGC, <laughs> Midwest Mayhem, and Civil War tournament. We just talk system, about like huge back. species. But yeah, but like the thing is, we talk about esports and like production and stuff more than we talk about the actual tournament results. Because one, I don't like spoilers, and two, it's kind of cool to like talk about what tournaments are doing and less than like what happened about them. That's what the numbers is for. Like if you just want that, you just listen to the numbers and you can turn us off. That's fine. Like we're gonna talk to you about tournaments. So we talked about Tokaigi. I didn't even mention who won. I didn't even mention who was in it. It didn't matter. Like, that was not the focal point of the discussion. Yeah, we get to talk about what we do behind the scenes, and it's a perspective that practically no one really kind of makes public. So getting to talk about it has been super fun, and I hope you guys really enjoy the podcast going on with it. Yeah, we're documenting we're documenting our growth as a scene. Yeah, anyone can go on Smash EG and look up the brackets and figure out the results. Like, we don't need to talk about that. So... But either way, but when something really cool happens, we'll definitely talk about it. Like Trello beating Leo. Like that was good. (laughs) Take us away, Sage. Thank you to everyone who continues to listen to the set count. We appreciate all the support that you've given us over the past few weeks of starting up this podcast. As always, you can find us at the set count on Twitter, or you can email us any questions you have at the set count at gmail.com. Hey, Seth. (laughs) Play that outro music. Complete!